So I finished my first uh, doctorate in um, 75. It was uh, based on literature. It started from a uh, philosophical question of knowledge uh, with people like uh, Russell and Whitehead, Carnap, Goodman, Nelson Goodman, who I came to know rather uh, well, I think, rather intimately, maybe even uh, later on. <coughs> uh, even organized in the beginning of the 80s uh, a conference, of course, there was a lot of conferences at that point, but one with him and around his uh, philosophy of art, in fact. And he, when he came, he, he said, well, you know, um, very interesting, and that's where my heart is, uh, art. He, he started as a, as a collect uh, collector of, of art, uh, then became logician and afterwards returned to art uh, as a philosopher then. I said, but you know, um, and this of course was something that I was, that I liked a lot also. Uh, I have written an, a ballet, uh, Goodman, Nelson Goodman, and it's, uh, in fact, it's a ballet with a sports theme, an ice hockey group, uh, uh, who danced a ballet with an original chord, etc., so really uh, amazing, and he said, but, you know, in order to have this performed in a professional way, that's not easy to get sponsored, of course. And yes, if you want to do a symposium on my work, fine, but if you could manage to have this performed and sponsored, that would be even better. Okay, so we uh, went up to the national television, and, uh, well, after a lot of uh, discussions, etc., they, they sponsored it. So it became a film out of it, uh, a program which was uh, broadcasted, etc. And he had his dancers, New York dancers, flown in and they performed and it was <laughs> not really philosophical, but you know. And the point was that uh, I said, well, if, uh, if it all goes wrong uh, and I'm, uh, I don't get a, a, a further sponsoring from my research, then maybe I can, uh, you know, go into the, uh, the business of I don't know, opera or something. <laughs> That's, that was a joke, but well. It was an, an interesting experience again, because, you know, he had this idea that we place too much emphasis on, um, uh, on logic to begin with, uh, logical reasoning, and even on the cognitive aspects in themselves, even on language in themselves, although he comes from that sort of uh, tradition, of course, uh, and dancing, artistic movements, artistic performances in themselves uh, teach, if you like, uh, maybe on the side, but maybe centrally also, teach about ethical issues. That was his, his main point. It's of course very interesting, and I think he's right. But of course, you know, translating this in, in uh, educational programs, that's an enormous job. It's like another culture that you introduce into the school. But that was his point, and it was an interesting uh, experience, I think, as well. So these people, you know, Carnap and, and uh, I mean, their works, Whitehead, uh, most of all, I think, I'm really fascinated by Whitehead. Um, they inspired me to uh, go and look at uh, knowledge as indeed something that you uh, work with, that you develop uh, in, in processes of searching, etc., rather than deducing. Again, this, this inductive way, I mean, this empirically based way, how can you start working on this as a researcher? And then looking at, at uh, in basically uh, linguistics and, and <coughs> or works from in linguistics and um, psychology on the one hand, and of course from uh, anthropological work on basically one um, people, that's the Dogon, in, in Mali, I uh, started developing <coughs> how can you uh, sort of frame uh, 
frame of reference, I call it afterwards, of how can you look at uh, <coughs> the way people construct, uh, build up uh, spatial knowledge, knowledge about spatial issues uh, in a different language, different uh, social cultural, different economic, ecological context, etc. <coughs> Inspired by this first work of uh, uh, well, natural science philosophy like uh, Whitehead, Russell and, and these people uh, did. And when I finished that uh, PhD, I said, yes, but now finally I want to go and try and see methodologically, really in, in the facts, let's say, how you can build this knowledge with a very different tradition. And that was my second, uh, the subject of my second PhD, uh, where I wanted to go and do field work, of course, on these same issues, on how do spatial uh, notions, concepts uh, develop, how to develop differently in together with a very different language, for example. So I went up to uh, the Collège de France in, in uh, Paris, in Levi Strauss's uh, boutique at that point, and uh, because he had this, this human relation area files, this Yale system, uh, with um, an overview, let's say, of everything that's published on every possible uh, culture, at least that's the idea, it's not the reality, but it's the idea, and a couple of thousand cultures, and millions and millions of, of uh, uh, papers, etc., uh, books, uh, in one room, one collective uh, system that you could um, use, you could uh, go there and ask your questions and see with a certain entry space, for example, across cultures, what has been published, what has been done already, with the uh, very important um, um, criterion, of course, for me, it should be the case when I go somewhere, uh, be it the Dogon or, s or somewhere else, uh, uh, these people should, of course, still, uh, to a large extent, continue their so-called own culture, own tradition. They shouldn't be completely Americanized. Like, for example, the truck in, in uh, the Pacific uh, was a possibility uh, in terms of uh, who has been studying there, etc. But the truck after the Second World War, uh, in a sense, don't exist anymore. That's an American base, military base. Uh, everybody drives squats and things like that, and the culture is finished. It's really absolutely smothered, if you like, in modernity, so-called. But it's terrible. In fact, the way people live is like, you know, waste people, if you like. And it's a very hard judgment, but I think it's true. Several of these islands, of course, are used, have been used as something else, and the people living there, yeah, you know, we'll give them some candies, and then they allow us to have this base, etc., which is uh, deadly for, for cultural traditions, I think, but well, not all of them, but so these fall out, these were not candidates for me to go and study because, I mean, it's a different study, it's a political uh, study which is interesting, of course, but it's not saying anything about, uh, is there, like in the Chinese case, for example, uh, why, in the Chinese case with, with uh, Needham, uh, uh, why is it so that uh, the Chinese did develop an an algebra, which you can read, study. There's a, a volume on it uh, in, in the series uh, developed by Needham, but somehow you can't translate it or you can't move it into our algebra. I mean, you feel that it's similar, but it's not the same. And they can use it. They can do practical things with it, like this irrigation system. This is still standing after more than a thousand years. So how how come? Because of course classical Chinese, I don't know that, but I know from literature that classical Chinese is a very different, structurally, deep structurally, a very different language from what we call uh, Indo-European languages. There is not, in a Chomskyan way then, the verb and the noun uh, uh, distinction which is central, but you have, if you like, a sort of verb language. Mm -hmm. 
That's a very f funny way of, but you know, in a shortcut, you could, you could call it that. Now, and that may be the reason why, in, you know, together with that language and the intuitions that you have translated in this language, you do not, uh, over, over time, of course, develop a geometry, but you develop an algebra. And geometry is speaking about forms of things meaning that at least nouns should be a very, very fundamental category in your language, next to verbs, which express operations on things. Uh, but things in themselves are a very basic, important category of, and correspond with how the world, let's say, uh, is constituted out of things, out of situations, not so deep intuitionally than in the Chinese case, where you can at least hint at uh, a, a very different sort of worldview of processes, uh, events are much more basic, let's say, than things. Again, think about the uh, my first inspirations there. Uh, Whitehead was the very first that I know of, of course, who tried to develop a systematic natural philosophy based on the uh, ground category of events. It's an event philosophy. It's the very first one that I know who tried to be true to this <laughs> and develop a worldview. Goodman does it a little bit afterwards, uh, but not in the same rigor, I think. Uh, but Carnap and, and etc. Russell, they don't. They stick with the noun, uh, the, the, the philosophy of uh, being, let's say, uh, essay, things are, and have certain qualities, and then it's almost, it's not logical, but it's natural that you would develop a systematic knowledge of the forms of these things, which ends in geometry. Okay, If you start with events, processes, that's a very different world. And you can say everything about this world, but it's different. And my question then was, I want a language like that, you know, like <laughs> classical Chinese, let's say, where people think in a different world, in an intuition uh, system in a, in a different world, and then see how do they uh, work with, how to develop uh, spatial notions. Is there a difference? I think there is. That was my, my hypothesis, if you like. And uh, now, if this is true, of course, then to put it very, very, very broadly and in a fashionable way, uh, the geometrization of uh, knowledge, uh, Einstein, that's just one way, right? That's very ambitious, of course. But then if, if you look at it, again, starting with my first uh, uh, impressions there when I came to study here, uh, my people are not in there. And who else is missing? Well, this event view on the world is missing in this Greek, or basically Greek, uh, 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 geometrization, let's say, of, of uh, worldview philosophy and that sort of thing. The world of things, the philosophy of being. Why not the philosophy of becoming, or of changing, or of processing, or something? No, we have a tradition of... Of course, there's exceptions. Heraclitus, of course, is the exception. Uh, look at what Prigozhin uh, already was doing in his younger years, saying this is the end of atomism and more room for, for Heraclitus. But that's not the general trend, right? It was like a bit exotic to, to do that sort of things, but well. So I looked in, in, in the system of, of uh, human relation area files in uh, Levi-Strauss's uh, center, and I found a couple of, uh, <coughs> five in fact, different cultures that could be a candidate for my sort of uh, research question, and I'll end it then with the uh, Navajo Apache group, uh, Athabascan languages, which are basically verb languages, if you can call it that way. I said, well, this is interesting, and of course there have been people studying them. There was already one uh, 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 dictionary uh, at that point, just one, but with a brilliant uh, linguist who died in his 90s, a really brilliant man, uh, Young uh, was his name, who was one of the 
only people around who, who could really talk fluently, who, was, who had become, as a white person, an authority in terms of linguistics for the Navajo themselves and for the several Apache groups. So quite a, well, daring and, and, and adventurous sort of person, but top linguist. Now, these are ideal conditions to have such a philosophical question as how do these people handle space? <laughs> you know, Kant, space, time, God, these three categories. Let's take one and have a look at, you know, illiterate people, how they work with this in this very different uh, linguistic structure. Okay. And that's how I came to select uh, the Navajo. And I uh, went up to one of the people working with them, a, a linguistic anthropologist, uh, Oswald Werner, who worked in Northwestern University in Chicago. I learned um, to, to uh, uh, write down and transcribe uh, the language with him. He had a, a very quick sort of course uh, developed for that. You, you needed about three, four weeks and then you were able to transcribe, so to listen to what people said, record them of course, and then uh, <laughs> with a lot of <laughs> energy and time transcribe them, uh, which is of course, and, and then translate in, in a second uh, moment and have it checked by people again and by the, uh, an interpreter, etc. <coughs> which was, of course, quite a step that already you could listen and transcribe the oral uh, messages rather than start from nothing, like in the Malinowski uh, case uh, in, in anthropology. So I went up there for about a month and then down to the reservation uh, for about a year. And, of course, this is a big uh, chunk of, of territory. It's about four times Belgium, uh, with 300,000 people uh, living on it. Uh, Navajo uh, spread. They're not living in villages. They are spread out. They're living on a canyon and in a canyon and on top of a mesa and what have you. So you have to go and look for people uh, all the time uh, in, in this vast uh, area with hardly any roads, uh, three roads in fact, uh, and that's it. So in, in a sense it's amazing that after well, 120, 130 years of Americanization you still have this. Of course you have schools, you have centers uh, where you have um, some, uh, there's one or two uh, hotels or motels uh, now one next to a beautiful canyon in the center, uh, Canyon de Che. Uh, there's missions, lots of lots of missions, all sorts, all branches. I didn't have an inkling that all this existed, but well, it's amazing and very aggressive sometimes, but well. Uh, you have that, but basically that's it, because people continue. And about when I worked there, and it's in uh, the end of the 70s, uh, <coughs> the estimate was that over half of the population was, to begin with, totally illiterate and indeed only speaking uh, their own language, uh, Navajo. So I was located uh, through a, a connection of, of Oswald Werner, who, who worked for most of his life with uh, Navajo. I was located in the north part, which is uh, very desert-like, uh, abandoned, let's say, very poor. And there was a school there which was started by uh, two anarchists. That's uh, typically American. Eh? They, they would either go someplace in the world, like Taiwan, for example. <laughs> I came to know somebody afterwards, an anarchist who uh, lived most of his life in, in Taiwan. Eh? Uh, or on one of the reservations, the Indian reservations in the United States. And they started a bicultural school there, and which was underway. It was uh, primary grades uh, only at that point, but interesting, because they said, you know, at least half the program has to be Navajo, uh, language and history and, and what have you. And then on uh, the other half uh, will be American, if you like. Anglo-American, meaning that, for example, uh, 
uh, the, the curriculum for mathematics teaching at this uh, primary level was uh, apparently bought, in, in this case, uh, from uh, Utah. Uh, so they, they bought a whole package, uh, which was at that point uh, so-called modern mathematics, uh, the Papi uh, system that we know here in, in the French-speaking part of Europe, eh? uh, which is a disaster, of course. I mean, for our children, let alone for those I felt, let alone for those from other uh, uh, origins. But well, they, they bought that because that was American and that was at that point uh, the way to go, starting with set theory, which is of course extremely abstract type of, of uh, mathematical thinking. But then logically on top of that you would have uh, arithmetic and logically on top of that. So it's the mathematical building, let's say, of the mathematician. Uh, modern, uh, so-called modern mathematics at so well that they do that for their little tribe, but it's totally inadequate for children because they're not small mathematicians. They are children who, you know, are empirically growing up, of course, with all sorts of trial and error, etc., and not in a clearly uh, deep structured system or something. And that's why it fails most of the time, except for some mathematical minds, apparently, but that's really the exception. Let alone if you use this in different uh, cultural contexts, then of course you've got to, to be expected a, a tremendous dropout, which of course happens. Uh, okay, so that was the context, but you can't just go there, you couldn't even at that time just go there and say, well, I'm going to do some research here for a year or longer eh? uh, because, you know, my research is important. And No, you had to go and confront <coughs> the local people, which in that case was the school board, totally Navajo, illiterate, uh, of that school. Uh, and you had to present what you wanted to do there. Now, of course, with an interpreter, because I didn't speak the language. And uh, so I was starting out explaining what I wanted to do and after a couple of minutes uh, the head of the school board had me stop and he intervened and was translated and he said you know what you're trying to do trying to study spatial concepts okay and how they develop what you're trying to do here seems to be important for what we are having as a problem namely this mathematics curriculum material. We run into problem with that. And apparently what you are trying to do here has links with it. Can you imagine illiterate person in this other language who understood at least enough of what I was trying to make clear, maybe even better than the philosophers over here, huh? and who said, yeah, this is something akin in this, you know, this overlaps somehow. So he said, if you can help us out with our problems here, with that curriculum material, then you can do your research. Which is amazing, really amazing. I didn't know the man or anything. And it was so important for me, and I hope for more uh, people, of course, uh, that I, <coughs> from there on, <coughs> I really invested in, in uh, well, uh, addressing the problems that, that, that he was uh, talking about. So I developed a, a, a small uh, curriculum book on uh, Navajo geometry, which was extremely exotic, you know, starting from what children know, how they move around, how they use their environment, environmental knowledge, etc., within their language. Then inviting the teachers to uh, decide on a, a set of terms that could be used in what would be geometry, elementary geometry, let's say, uh, uh, to construct these terms, but because that's what they did. And then say, uh, okay, and now I have four or five cases, five cases it was that you are known, uh, you, you know from experience of children, for example, walking around with a, a herd of uh, sheep and, and goats in a canyon and getting back home after two or three days as a boy of, of, or girl 
of six, seven years age of age. That's what happens, what still happens. I can't come home, I can tell you, in, in a canyon there. It's impossible. They do, with a dog and with their herd. Now, how do they do that? So they have knowledge, they have spatial knowledge. But it's not immediately identifiable, translatable in what we think it should be, geometric Euclidean terms or something. Uh, a distance, for example, is uh, a certain amount of, of uh, hours, we would say, a time that you're walking around with markers in the landscape, of course, with the sun that's moving, etc. And on the basis of these, you have an idea of distance covered. And you have an idea of where you're going to land, where there is some water at least, and etc. How you're going to get back after two or three days home, etc. So that's how you organize your, work your world spatially. And they can do that, they actually do that, the children, these children, in their verb language, which is all of it very different from... So they use, of course, intelligence, they build up knowledge, etc. But it can be recognized and it doesn't connect at all with this uh, set theory <laughs> that they're taught at school. Okay, that's the, the point. So I, I made this, this little curriculum book as a first step and I thought, well, this is really exotic as a book in English, of course, but with Navajo uh, examples and terms. So I published it myself in, in a private publication, but I had to republish it because apparently people thought, yeah, that's a good line of thinking. And, you know, it, it went out like that <laughs> to different places in the world because, of course, you don't have anything like this. It's so weird. It's so out of the normal categories. In, in, in educational studies, in psychology, nobody would sponsor you to do that. But of course, a, a strange guy like me, sort of philosopher who is, you know, I was free to do that. And, and that's interesting too. And the recognition it gets. So I uh, made my uh, what, uh, academic book, let's say, together with... Uh, no. I had it co-authored by, by my main interpreter uh, at that point, uh, Frank Harvey is, is his name, and I presented it to a, a University of Pennsylvania press and I said, yes, yes, very good, we'll publish it. Now that's a beautiful sort of step, of course, because all of a sudden you are, yeah, one of the good guys, let's say. Uh, as an anthropologist, of course, which is still a bit exotic or eccentric, but still, it's, it's a, a very good house, you know, a very stable house. So they do what a publisher should do, you know, it, it lands on all sorts of tables, academic tables, it lands in all sorts of academic journals. And that's wonderful, it, it pays back in an enormous way. You can't do that on your own, like with my little curriculum book there, I mean, and the, the book, the, the curriculum book was even, you know, uh, had a second career because of that, I think. And people get interested and start looking for what else did he do, etc. And I was in main journals of mathematics teaching, uh, like for the learning of mathematics, for example, these sort of journals, which is n normally not where an anthropologist can be found. But yes, this was like, yeah, maybe there's a point in this. We are too Western in the way we, and starting uh, from there, I mean, that's not my work, but uh, from Latin American uh, colleagues, uh, mathematicians in that, uh, in that case, uh, was this, this stream of, of uh, research and publications and, and conferences uh, now known as ethno-mathematics. And at the same time, I was busy doing things and some other people, and it sort of added into a multidisciplinary or an interdisciplinary uh, other way of looking at mathematical education than the Western, let's say, uh, uh, rationalistic one. And that's a major step, at least in my career, but I think it's probably a turn in, in history and that sort of thing.